Hey AP students, in this video we're going to discuss how to hippo a document on a document-based question at DBQ and I'll give you many examples of how to get this done. First off, let's talk about exactly what does HIPPO represent, what does it mean. It's an acronym meant to help you provide a deep analysis of a primary source, but it also helps provide just good writing ideas for almost any setting. What does the acronym stand for? We're, we're going to start with the H, of course, historical context. You give me events that led up to a document that kind of surround the document as well. Intended audience, pretty self-explanatory. What is the purpose of the document. The author has a reason for writing this. Uh, can you kind of flush out what that means? Point of view. What is the point of view of the author um, who created that document? Think we all have bias in some sort of a way. Kind of flush that out as well. And then outside information, not um, specifically mentioned in the document. What can you bring to the table with that? I'll give you an example of that here in a moment as well. When do you use this? This is specifically on a document-based question. You need to do this for four of the seven documents that you'll get on a DBQ. I like to urge my students to go on and use it for HIPPO at least five of the documents just to make sure that you get the point for that. What happens if you only HIPPO three of the seven documents? Well, then you will lose that one point. You just want to have the insurance that you do get it correct and that you get the credit for that. Number five, um, do you have to do all four, five parts of HIPPO for one particular document? No, you only need to do this, um, pick one letter for one document. You only need to write your deep analysis by using one letter of HIPPO. Let's get to some examples of what HIPPO um, looks like and, and how you can use that in a document-based question. Here we have historical context. It's a big deal in AP U.S. history. I'm not going to read over this entire quote from John Winthrop. It's a very famous sermon in U.S. history, a model of Christian charity. You can see it's written in 1630. It's the first thing I always look for is the date. And then I look at the sourcing. It's John Winthrop. He's a Puritan. He's male. Um, I'm thinking about what, what's going on in U.S. history on 1630. And I can see this is written on board a ship as um, people are crossing the Atlantic Ocean. So this would be a good idea just to pause the video. Um, read through the actual quote, but you can notice that what I've done in yellow is I've annotated. I urge my students to go in and annotate. I see the very famous line, we sh shall be as a city upon a hill, the eyes of all people are upon us. So let's look at some examples of how to exactly hippo something of this nature when you get a quote for it. So what is historical context? Guiding questions to answer. What's happening at the time of the source? When and where was the source created? How might the timing affect the content? And does the context affect the reliability of the source? So here's what I would write about. Say on a, on a DBQ, I'm now writing the essay and I'm looking at document one. Let's pretend that a model of Christian charity was document one. Here's what I would write that would get credit for historical context. Winthrop's sermon was given while on board the Arbella as the first Puritan settlers approached their new home. The Puritans facing religious persecution. There I'm giving context of the document, why it was written, and so forth, in England, came to New England to create a model religious colony, which is reaffirmed by Winthrop's plea for the settlers to practice Christian virtues such as patience, meekness, and gentleness. So I hope you see what I'm doing right there. I'm giving some things that kind of led up to that document being written. I do answer what's happening at the time of the source. When, where was it created? How might the timing affect the content? You see that all ties back into those guiding questions with historical context. So be specific with this one. Using SFI and historical context will confirm to your reader that you do have a deep understanding. If you're unfamiliar with SFI, what that, what that means, it's specific factual information, or you can think of them as key terms as well. Number two, intended audience. To me, this one's a little bit easier, but you, uh, but a lot of times students tend to forget this one and skip it over a little bit. So what is intended audience? To whom is the document directed? Does the audience affect the tone or the content of the actual document? Here we go for that quote for, from John Winthrop. Winthrop addressed a small group of Puritans sailing aboard the Arbella as they approached the Massachusetts Bay Colony. In his sermon, he implored his followers to create a close-knit community where individuals work for each other and then sacrifice for the greater good purpose let's look at the third one so what is the purpose of a document so guiding questions why did the author create it 
what is the goal of the document? To inform, to entertain, to persuade, to teach, to mislead. Um, there's many questions you can ask as you're thinking about what you want to say for the purpose of a document. This one in particular, so Winthrop intended for a sermon to inspire the first group of Puritans during an uncertain trip overseas, wished to remind them of the necessities of hard work and sacrifice in order to survive in an unfamiliar territories. Only a strong community that's woven together will make it in the harsh conditions of a new world. Number four, point of view. So what is the author's point of view of this particular document? So guiding questions, what is the author's relationship to the event? How does this affect the author's understanding of the event? What is the author's profession, gender, social class, religion? How might the author's point of view influence or shape the document? Can you find any sort of bias? And like we mentioned earlier, we are all biased in some sort of a way. So be thinking about that as you start to put this together. So this one, here we go. I'm going to start to identify who Winthrop is early on. So Winthrop, a strong believer of the Puritan faith, see I'm giving you his point of view, saw the many potential dangers of disunion, quarrels, and disputes that would have put the new colonies of future in question. His Puritan beliefs drove him, there I'm reaffirming it again, that he's, he's seeing things from the, from the point of view of a strong Puritan, um, to use many themes of religion to inspire his fellow colonists to join together and work for the common good as they arrived in the new world. So I like to think about this one as um, really searching for bias in particular, and then maybe trying to identify that in writing. Last one, outside information. This one can be a little bit tricky right here. So what exactly am I talking about here? So you just read that quote. Now we're going to try and bring in outside information that was not mentioned specifically in that quote, a model of Christian charity. So guiding questions, what is an example of evidence not found in the document that would refute or support the point of the document? Do this in other places as well. Sprinkle throughout the essay very liberally. Do as much as you can with it. So last one, let's take a look. Winthrop's sermon on Christian charity emphasized how the new colony would be a small, close-knit community based on Puritan theology. His sermon signaled a complete break from the governance of the Anglican Church, and Winthrop wanted to establish Massachusetts Bay as an example of how to purify as what he saw the corruption within England's most influential church. So I'm seeing two um, pieces of SFI, two key terms, Massachusetts Bay and Anglican Church, they were not mentioned in that document whatsoever, but you can sometimes inject those into your um, writing to get a credit for your, um, at least using the O part of HIPPO. I can tell you that many teachers exclude teaching the O for their students. They just simply teach HIP for their students, but as a reminder, um, always do this for at least four of the seven documents that you're given on a DVQ. Common errors. Let's finish this thing out. Easy mistakes to make when writing a DVQ and, and using HIPPO in particular. Always remember um, to avoid writing in past tense. Avoid template writing. You don't want to say the author's point of view was or the intended audience was. It can be as easy as saying something like um, uh, Winthrop saw, Smith viewed, or something of that nature. Number three, avoid using the author's first name. Use only if you personally know the author. So I'm never going to refer to Abraham Lincoln as just Abraham. I never personally knew him, so I'll always refer to him as just Lincoln. Number four, go beyond simply identifying the audience. These are supposed to help you make a deep analysis of the document. Think about level two writing. How and why does the author's point of view or the intended audience or purpose actually matter? Two to three sentences for HIPPO should get you credit for it. And this is the last thing, very, very important. When you get done with using any document on a DBQ, make sure to cite it at the end of the sentence like you see at the very bottom. So make sure you're, you, you cite the document by putting it in parentheses right there, doc2 at the end of your sentence. When you're done and completely finished with your, making your point, make sure to do that as you finish out. Let me give you an example of the difference between just using a document and then hippoing a document as we finish out. It's be a good idea to pause the video, take a look and, at the quotes here. Um, these are made up here. Let's pretend that you've just read a letter from a Spanish conquistador named Vasquez. The first example is just using the document. Um, you'll see no example of um, using the author's point of view or the intended audience of that first one. And then the second one, you'll see an actual example of um, point of view of this uh, fictional conquistador named Vasquez, 
where you know that he's using point of view, uh, that I'm, I'm trying to show you point of view right there, where it says Vasquez only viewed the Native Americans as weak. So if Paul's take a look at it, I think it, hopefully this will make some sense. One, you're not seeing anything about historical context. The other, you are seeing elements of hippo being used. Tricky documents. You also have, you'll have a kind of a curveball thrown at you sometimes with some of the documents on a DBQ. What happens if you get data, graphs and charts and those sorts of things? In some cases, data, graphs, it can be tricky because you often cannot give an author's point of view, purpose, or intended audience when you're just given data. However, you can easily explain the historical context or um, the outside information, the O and hippo, if you do encounter this particular issue. And so um, those are some good examples. Let me show you real quick of the difference between um, hippoing and then just simply using a document. Let's sort of try to see what it's like to avoid template writing as well. So here we have a cartoon. I'm going to show you some examples right here. So King Andrew the First political cartoon. Template writing, the purpose of the cartoon is to make Andrew Jackson look like an absolute monarch and abuser of power. But a more sophisticated example of that would be the, uh, the cartoon intended to expose Jackson as an absolute monarch rather than be limited by the U.S. Constitution. you got to look at the section where he's standing on top of the U.S. Constitution to make that point. Template writing, again, you want to avoid this. The point of view of the artist is that he's critical of Jackson since he drew him as a king and destroyed the bank. More sophisticated example of portrayal of Jackson as an absolute monarch stemmed from a pro-Whig advocate. There we're identifying the point of view um, of the Bank of the United States. Template writing, we want to avoid this. The intended audience is people who do not like Jackson as abuser of power. Better example, the cartoonist appealed to potential undecided voters to garner support for the Whig candidate by criticizing Jackson's abuse of power. One more, template writing for context. The historical context was that there was an election of 1832 between Jackson Democrats and the Whig Party. Better example of context. The election of 32 placed the Jackson Democrats campaigning for the common man against the Whigs who supported national policies such as national bank and then protective tariffs as well. Okay, so I've given you several examples of HIPPO, how to use it in a document. Um, it is actually quite easy, but it's also easy to forget to do some of these things as well. If you still have questions, let me know. Thanks for watching. Good luck.